Aunt Anne was good to us, and we loved her and her family, just like Dad, but like Dad, she insisted on having her own way. While we reluctantly accepted Dad's bossing as one of the privileges of his rank as head of the family, we had no intention of accepting it from anybody else, including his oldest sister. After we moved to Montclair, Aunt Anne came to stay with us for several days while Mother and Dad were away on a lecture tour. She made it plain from the start that she was not a guest, but the temporary commander-in-chief. She even used the front stairs leading from the front hall to the second floor instead of the back stairs, which led from the kitchen to a hallway near the girls' bathroom. None of us was allowed to use the front stairs because Dad wanted to keep the varnish on them looking nice. Daddy will be furious if he comes home and finds you've been using his front stairs, we told Aunt Anne. Nonsense, she cut off. The back stairs are narrow and steep, and I, for one, don't propose to use them. As long as I'm here, I'll use any stairs I have a mind to. Now rest your features and mind your business. She sat at Dad's place at the foot of the table, and we resented this, too. Ordinarily, Frank, as the oldest boy, sat in Dad's place, and Anne, as the oldest girl, sat at Mother's. We also disapproved of Aunt Anne's blunt criticism of how we kept our bedrooms, and some of the changes she made in the family routine. What do you do? Keep pigeons in here? She said she'd say when she walked into the bedroom shared by Frank and Bill. I'm coming back in 15 minutes, and I want to find this room in apple pie order. And I don't care what time your regular bedtime is. As long as I'm in charge, we'll do things my way. Off with you now. Like Grandma and Dad, Aunt Anne thought that all Irishmen were shiftless and that Tom Greaves was the most shiftless, shiftless of all Irishmen. She told him so at least once a day, and Tom was scared to death of her. Experience has established the fact that a person cannot move from a small, peaceful home into the family of a dozen without having something finally snap. We saw this happen time after time with Dad's, with Dad's stenographers and with the cooks who followed Mrs. Cunningham. In order to reside with a family of, do of a dozen, it is necessary either to be brought up from birth in such a family as we were, or to become accustomed to it as it grew, as Dad, Mother, and Tom Greaves did. It was at the dinner table that something finally snapped in Aunt Anne. We had spent the entire meal purposely making things miserable for her. Bill had hidden under the table, and we had removed his place and chair so that she wouldn't realize he was missing. And while we ate, Billy thumped Aunt Anne's legs with the side of his hand. Who's kicking me, she complained. Saints alive. We said no one. Well, you don't have a dog, do you? We didn't, and we told her so. Our collie had died some time before this. Well, somebody's certainly kicking me hard. She insisted that the child sitting on each side of her slide his chair toward the head of the table so that no legs could possibly reach her. Bill thumped again. Somebody is kicking me, Aunt Anne said, and I intend to get to the bottom of it, literally. Bill thumped again. Aunt Anne picked up the tablecloth and looked under the table, but Bill had anticipated her and retreated to the other end. The table was so long you couldn't see that far underneath without getting down on your hands and knees, and Aunt Anne was much too dignified to stoop to any such level. When she put the tablecloth down again, Bill crawled forward and licked her hand. You do too have a dog, Aunt, Aunt Anne said accusingly, while she dried her hand on a napkin. Speak up now. Who brought that miserable cur into the house? Bill thumped her again and retreated. She picked up the tablecloth and looked. She put it down again, and he licked her hand. She looked again, and then dangled her hand temptingly between her knees. Bill couldn't resist this trap, and this time Aunt Anne was ready for him. When he started to lick, she snapped her knees together like a vice, trapped his head, his head in the folds of her skirt, and reached down and grabbed him by the hair. Come out of there, you scamp you, she shouted. I've got you. You can't get away this time. Come out, I say. She didn't give Bill a chance to come out 
under his own power. She yanked and he came out by the hair of his head, screaming and kicking. In those days, Phil was not a snappy dresser. He liked old clothes, preferably held together with safety pins and held up by old neckties. When he wore a necktie around his neck, which was as seldom as possible, he sometimes evened up the ends by trimming the longer with a pair of scissors. His knickers usually were partially unbuttoned in the front, what the Navy calls the Commodore's privilege. They were completely unfastened at the legs and hung down to his ankles. During the course of a day, his stockings rode gradually down his legs and by dinner had partially disappeared into his sneakers. When mother was at home, she made him wear such appurtenances as a coat and a belt. In her absence, he had grown slack. When Aunt Anne jerked him out, a piece of string connecting a buttonhole in his shirt with a buttonhole in the front of his trousers suddenly broke. Bill grabbed for his pants, but it was too late. Go to your room, you scamp you, Aunt Anne said, shaking him. Just wait until your father comes home. He'll know how to take care of you. Bill pick up, picked up his knickers and did as he was told. He had a new respect for Aunt Anne, and the whole top of his head was smarting from the hair pulling. Aunt Anne sat down with deceptive calm and gave us a disarming smile. I want you children to listen carefully to me, she almost whispered. There is not a living soul here, including the baby, who is cooperative. I've never seen a more spoiled crowd of children. As she went on, her voice grew louder, much louder. Tom Greaves opened the pantry door a crack and peeked in. For those of you who like to believe that an only child is a selfish child, let me say you are 100% wrong. From what I have seen, this is the most completely selfish household in the entire world. She was roaring now, wide open, and it was the first time we had ever seen her that way. Except that her voice was an octave higher, it might have been Dad sitting there in his own chair. From this minute on, pipe down, every last one of you, or I'll lambast the hides off you. I'll fix you so you can't sit down for a month. Do you understand? Does everybody understand? In case you don't realize it, I've had enough. With that, determined to show us she wasn't going to let us spoil her meal, she put a piece of pie in her mouth. But she was so upset that she choked and slowly turned a deep purple. She clutched at her throat. We were afraid she was dying and were ashamed of ourselves. Tom, watching at the door, saw his duty. Putting aside his fear of her, he ran into the dining room and slapped her on the back. Then he grabbed her arms and held them high over her head. You'll be all right in a minute, Aunt Anne, he said. His system worked. She gurgled and finally caught her breath. Then, remembering her dignity, she jerked her arms out of his hands and drew herself up to her full height. Keep your hands to yourself, Greaves, to yourself, Greaves she said in a tone that indicated her belief that his next step would be to loosen her corset. Don't ever let me hear you make the fatal mistake of calling me Aunt Anne again. And after this, mind your own... She looked slowly around the table and then decided to say it anyway. Damned business. There was no doubt after that who was boss, and Aunt Anne had no further trouble with us. When Dad and Mother returned home, all of us expected to be disciplined. But we had misjudged Aunt Anne. You look like you've lost weight, Dad said to her. The children didn't give you any trouble, did they? Not a bit, said Aunt Anne. They behaved beautifully once we got to understand each other. We got along just fine, didn't we, children? She reached out fondly and rumpled Bill Billy's hair, which didn't need rumpling. Ouch, Billy whispered to her, grinning in relief. It still hurts. Have a heart. We had better success with another guest whom we set out deliberately to discourage. She was a woman psychologist who came to Montclair every fortnight from New York to give us intelligence tests. It was her own idea, not dad's or mother's, but they welcomed her. She was planning to publish a paper about the effects of dad's teaching methods on our intelligence quotients. She was thin and sallow, with angular features and a black mustache, not quite droopy enough to hide a horsey set of upper teeth. We hated her and suspected that the feeling was mutual. 
At first, her questions were legitimate enough. Arithmetic, spelling, languages, geography, and the sort of purposeful confusion about ringing numbers and underlining words in which some psychologists place particular store. After we had completed the initial series of tests, she took us one by one into the parlor for personal interviews. Even mother and dad weren't allowed to be present. The interviews were embarrassing and insulting. Does it hurt when your mother spanks you? She asked each of us, peering searchingly into our eyes and breathing into our faces. You mean your mother never spanks you? She seemed disappointed. Well, how about your father? Oh, he does. That appeared to be heartening news. Does your mother pay more attention to the other children than she does to you? How many baths do you take a week? Are you sure? Do you think it would be nice to have still another baby brother? You do? Goodness. We decided that if dad and mother knew the kinds of questions we were being asked, they wouldn't like them any better than we did. Anne and Ernestine had made up their minds to explain the situation to them. When destiny delivered the psychologist into our hands, locks, stock, and mustache. Mother had been devising a series of job aptitude tests, and the desk by her bed was piled with pamphlets and magazines on psychology. Ernestine was running idly through them one night, while Mother was reading aloud to us from The Five Little Peppers and How They Grew, when she came across a bunch of intelligence tests. One of them was the test which the New York woman was in the process of giving us. Not the embarrassing personal questions, but the business of circling numbers, spelling, and filling in blanks. The correct answers were in the back. Snakes, hips, Ernestine crowed. Got it. Mother looked up absently from her book. Don't mix up my work, Ernest Ernie, she said. What are you after? Just want to borrow something, Ern told her. Well, don't forget to put it back when you're through with it, will you? Where was I? Oh, I remember. Joel had just said that if necessary, he could help support the, support the family by selling papers and shining shoes down at the depot. She resumed her reading. The psychi psychologist had already given us the first third of the test. Now, Anne and Ernestine tutored us on the second third until we could run right down a page and fill in the answers without even reading the questions. The last third was an oral word association test, and they coached us on that, too. We're going to be the smartest people she ever gave a test to, Ern told us, and the queerest, too. Make her think we're smart, but uncivilized because we haven't had enough individual attention. That's what she wants to think, anyway. Act nervous and queer, Anne said. While she's talking to you, fidget and scratch yourself. Be as nasty as you can. That won't require much effort that, from most of you. There's no need our tutoring you on that. The next time the psychologist came out from New York, she sat us at intervals around the wall of the parlor with books on our laps to write on. She passed each of us a copy of the second third of the test. When I say commence, work as quickly as you can, she told us. You have half an hour, and I want you to get as far along in the test as you can. If any of you should happen to finish before the time is up, bring your papers to me. She looked at her watch. Ready? Now turn your test papers over and start. Remember, I'm watching you, so don't try to look at your neighbor's paper. We ran down the pages, filling in the blanks. The older children turned in their papers within ten minutes. Lillian, the youngest being examined, finally turned hers in within 20. The psychologist looking at Lillian's paper, the psychologist looked at Lillian's paper and her mouth dropped open. How old are you, dearie? She asked. Six, said Lil. I'll be seven in June. There's something radically wrong here, the visitor said. I haven't had a chance to grade all of your papers, but do you know you have a high, higher IQ than Nicholas Murray Butler? I read a lot, Lil said. The psychologist glanced at the other tests and shook her head. I don't know what to think, she sighed. You've certainly shown remarkable improvement in the last two weeks. Maybe we'd better get on to the last third of the test. I'm going to go around the, worm, around the room and say a word to each of you. I want you to answer instantly the first word that comes into your mind. Now, won't that be a nice little game? Anne twitched. Ernestine scratched. Martha bit her nails. We'll go by ages, the visitor continued. 
Anne first. She pointed to Anne. Knife, said the psycholog psychologist. Stab, wound, bleed, slit throat, murder, disembowel, scream, shriek, replied Anne, without taking a breath, and so fast that the words flowed together. Jesus, said the psychologist, let me get that down. You're supposed to answer one word, but let me get it all down anyway. She panted in excitement as she scribbled in her pad. All right, Ernestine, your turn. Just one word. Black. Jack, said Ernestine. The visitor looked at Martha. Foot. Kick, said Martha. Hair. Louse, said Frank. Flower. Stink, said Bill. The psychologist was becoming more and more excited. excited. She looked at Lil. Dropping, said Lil, upsetting the apple cart. But I haven't even asked you your word yet. The visitor exclaimed, so that's it. Let me see what your word was going to be. I thought so. Your word was bird. And they told you to say droppings, didn't they? Lil nodded sheepless, sheepishly. And they told you just how to fill out the rest of the test, didn't they? I suppose the answers were given to you by your mother, so you would impress me with how smart you are. We started to snicker and then to roar. But the psychologist didn't think it was funny. You're all nasty little cheats, she said. Don't think for a minute you pulled the wool over my eyes. I saw through you from the start. She picked up her wraps and started for the front door. Dad had heard us laughing and came out of his office to see what was going on. If there was any excitement, he wanted to be in on it. Well, he beamed, it sounds as if it's been a jolly test. Running along so soon? Tell me frankly, what do you think of my family? She looked at us and there was an evil glint in her eye. I'm glad you asked me that, she whinnied. Unquestionably, they are smart. Too damn smart for their breeches. Does that answer your question? As to whether they were aided and abetted in an attempted fraud, I cannot say. But my professional advice is to bear down on them. A good thrashing right now, from the oldest to the youngest, might be just the thing. She slammed the front door, and Dad looked glumly at us. All right, he sighed. What have you been up to? That woman's going to write a paper on the family. What did you do to her? Anne twitched, Ernestine scratched, Martha bit her nails. Dad was getting angry. Hold still and speak up. No nonsense. Do you want another baby brother? Anne asked. Does it hurt when your mother spanks you, said Ernestine. When did you have your last bath? Martha inquired. Are you sure? Hmm? Dad raised his hands in surrender and shook his head. He looked old and tired now. Sometimes I don't think if it's worth it, he said. Why didn't you come and tell your mother and me about it if she was asking questions like that? Oh, well, on the other hand, why the bearded old goat? Dad started to smile. If she writes a paper about any of that, I'll sue her for everything she owns, including her birth certificate, if she has one. He opened the door into his office. Come in and give me all the frightful details. After you, Dr. Butler, Ernestine told Lil. A few minutes later, Mother came into the office, where we were perched on the edges of her and Dad's desks. The stenographers had abandoned their typewriters and were crowded around us. What's the commotion, Frank? she asked Dad. I could hear you bellowing all the way up in the attic. Oh, Lord, Dad wheezed. Start at the beginning, at the beginning kids. I want your mother to hear this, too. The bearded old goat. Not, not you, Lily. And that is the end of chapter 15. And tomorrow night, we will continue with chapter 16. Have a good night, everyone.